Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. I hope you know by now that we are doing a series on the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular ses series, we are just beginning a new set of lessons, is for the months of July, August, and September of 2014. And this particular lesson, series of lessons is known as, or is called The Teachings of Jesus. We're going to see what Jesus taught about a number of different subjects. And the first of these lessons is the teachings of Jesus about our loving Heavenly Father. It's lesson one, and it's for study by most church members on July 5 of 2014. But before we actually jump into the lesson, we hope that you've got your Bible in hand, and we're going to have a word of prayer to ask God, the Spirit to guide us as we study this lesson together. Our wonderful Father, we are so thankful that we have the privilege of addressing you as Father. It's a little hard for us to imagine that someone as powerful as you are that could create and control the universe wants to be known as our Father. And so, once again, we give you thanks. We ask that you will guide us as we talk about this very important and endearing subject is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what did Jesus teach about the Father? Of course, the idea that God is our Father was presented even in the Old Testament. You can see that in places like Isaiah 63, verse 16, 64, 8, Jeremiah 3, 4, and 19, and Psalm 103, verse 13. However, the most common expression used for God in the Old Testament is actually God's personal name, which in the Hebrew was pronounced something like Yahweh. And that name is used for God some 6,800 times just in the Old Testament. So you can see it was very common. Now, um, my Bible doesn't use that word at all. Yes. So that's how do you explain that? That's Hebrew. Um, Okay, so what do you use for English? Huh? How do you know which word he's using in English? Okay, in most English Bibles, not all, especially the paraphrases, but in most of the more traditional English translations, when the, when the Hebrew word is Yahweh, the <coughs> personal name for God, the, the English translations will use the word Lord with small caps. Lord, small caps, and you know that it's talking about that personal name for God. So is it a kind of a capital, full capital, then small caps? No, they're, they're, the whole thing is, the whole thing, yeah. <coughs> is I, I, it depends on how the printer decided to do it. But basically, if the words L-O-R-D and capital letters, you, is, that's a translation of this word Yahweh. So the, the regular Te word. In the Old Testament. Now, this is, only applies to the Old Testament. Oh, okay. 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 Now, that presents us with a considerable problem. What do you suppose the problem is? Who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. Jesus. Whoa. That shocks a lot of people, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, how would you know that for sure? Well, look, look at some passages. Look at, for example, at 1 Corinthians 10, uh, first four verses. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of, Jesus, of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. And remember how they were fed and, and watered out there in the wilderness. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. But that's not the only place, just in case someone has a question about that. Look at John, John 5, 39. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And of course, he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. And what was their scripture in those days? What we call the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament. And these very scriptures speak about me. Okay? These very scriptures speak about me. And then the place where he spells it out maybe in the most detail, Jesus himself, Luke 24, 44, then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, what would that be? 
what we call the Pentateuch. Or the could five be, books of Moses, you know. the writings of the prophets, and you know there are a lot of prophets in the Old Testament, and the Psalms, and the, they use the word Psalms to refer to the third section of the Jewish Old Testament because it was the biggest in the, in the first book in that series. Some other versions call it the Holy Writings or the Hagiographer. Um, but this is the entire Old Testament. So he says, everything written about me in the entire Old Testament is what you're supposed to learn about. So it's pretty clear that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus. So how can we learn about the Father in the Old Testament if the God of the Old Testament is Jesus? You got a problem, right? One other verse mm -hmm. is earlier in Luke 24, <laughs> verses 25 to 27. Uh, 27 says, and Jesus explained to them, this is uh, on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, mm -hmm. beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. Yeah, exactly. So he, he did it. He actually demonstrated it for them. Yes, very good. Well, of course, the kind of relationship Jesus wants us to have is spelled out in John 17. And if you remember, he says right there at the beginning of that prayer, just before he got to the Garden of Gethsemane, we don't know exactly where it was, whether he was praying as he moved along, talking to his disciples, or whether he stopped to pray somewhere on the way, or whether this is just after he got the Garden, but it suggests in John that, that this was, he, wasn't yet, he hadn't yet reached the Garden of Gethsemane, so we don't know exactly where this prayer was prayed. But in that prayer, he says, there are three sections. Do you remember what the three sections are? The first section where he says, the time is eternal coming. life is to know. to know God. And the, which Jesus. Is the Father. Now he's Jesus here on this earth. Right. And so now he's speaking about, presumably about the Father in heaven, right? So eternal life is to know God, right? And then he goes on, he talks about the very close relationship between himself and the Father. Then he talks about his relationship to the disciples and how he wants them to be like himself in their relationship to the Father. And then the third section is he talks about, and all those who learn about me from their writings and their teachings, I want them to have the same kind of relationship with you, Father, that I have with you. Right there in his prayer, just before he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane. So I don't know how it could be clearer than that. And he says, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. And to know at that time, and I don't think it's changed, is you have to have study the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, well, or excuse me, what we call the Old Testament. It wasn't done. Yeah. But then, I mean, the obvious problem is, how do you get to know somebody that you can't see, you can't hear, you can't touch? Of course, you, I suppose you could say you can't smell or taste either. I mean, those are all the senses we have. And... What do we do? Have to listen or read. Okay. No, no, we, <laughs> no substitute. And what did Jesus say to Thomas about that? Do you remember? Blessed are those who believe without having seen. Believe, believe without having seen. Why do you suppose he said that? How many people following that experience or following Pentecost? are going to be able to see him. We're not going to see him. So Jesus is saying, I plan to place a blessing on people who come to know me and trust me and love me based on the record that I and my disciples are going to leave behind. Right? So now the, the, the tougher question, now let's get down to the real issues here. How do we know that God really loves us? Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> well, I think starting out, you hear from somebody that he does. Uh -huh. And then after that, you kind of test for yourself to find out. Okay, and how do you do that? How do you test for yourself to yeah. find out? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty individual. It's kind of a little bit hard to come up with a how to find out whether God is, loves yeah. you or not. <laughs> yeah, basic existence and all that goes with it. Yeah, okay. Well, but some would argue in rebuttal to that, that uh, there seems to be <clears throat> in the breast of every human being, Christian or Jewish or 
pagan or whatever you've got some inclination to think there is some okay some superpower or something and uh, so maybe you're just uh, maybe you're just assuming these experiences you think are, are God manifesting his love for you maybe that's just kind of a figment of your imagination so no I, what I'm kind of thinking about is like if my mother came up to me and said see that girl over there you should love her mm -hmm. okay how <laughs> I can't do what she says at that point there's some things have to happen to make that happen and it probably won't happen <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, okay I just a little side note. Um, I have a friend down that I work with that puts a little something up on the board every day to um, sort of remind us about what we're trying to accomplish in our job there and seeing patients and so forth. And he said, the one today said something like this If you don't believe in mir miracles, perhaps you've forgotten that you are one. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we can accept the testimony of others what, as a possibility that's been suggested. Where would you find such testimony? Um, the most famous verse in the Bible, right? John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, I mean... He must have had something in mind to give his son. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty incredible thing, right? I For God himself to come down you here. I understand what the words mean. Yeah, well, that's what we're talking about. In order to understand what the words mean, though, and going on with your analogy of your mother showing you some girl, how would you love that girl eventually? You'd have to get to know her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just as we have to get to know. And how do we get to know? We've got many verses, books. If, you're, if your life is going along swimmingly and you have no concept of God and you've been, all your friends or associates uh, don't have any, uh, and you, life's good uh, economically, health-wise, and so forth, why would you want to be interested in, in finding out about something else? I mean, that's, that's a set, pretty... Uh, big hurdle to overcome. Is, well, is there any empirical way? <coughs> well, I'm gonna, I think there are. Uh, now, this would be argued by a lot of people, but I would say, as my, I did my art, the <coughs> saying I just quoted here, the fact that we're alive and we're breathing and so forth, we didn't, we didn't plan that for ourselves. Now, evolutionists will tell you that, oh, well, somehow or other we evolved, but anybody who studied human anatomy and physiology and so forth enough to realize how complicated it is, are going to have a hard time believing that. Yeah, but the, the public school system in particular uh, have dumbed down the, pop, the, <laughs> the populace that they don't have any concept of God. Yeah. And uh, you, you do that for a generation or two, and yet, yet there's still a few people that do. How do you somehow... Uh, find any hooks into the mind or that you can make contact with, with people like that that have it's a void, a vacuum you're trying to uh, Now here's another problem. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up all the challenges here first Look at Matthew 18.10 See that you don't despise any of these little ones Jesus is talking to his disciples about children Their angels in heaven I tell you are always in the presence of my Father in heaven so is that is our father that we're trying to get to know is he far away somewhere billions of light years away in, in heaven somewhere not if he's omnipresent well what does that mean omnipresent present everywhere could he really be how do we understand things like that poorly yeah. <laughs> not sure we can this side of heaven <coughs> yeah well, Jesus himself said some words that might be helpful. They're found in Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. Would any of you who are fathers give your son a stone when he asked for bread? Or would he give him a snake when he asked for a fish? Bad as you are, so now he's making some kind of judgments about us, right? Bad as you are, you know how to give good things to your children. 
how much more then will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Once again, Father in heaven, notice. So, um, we know about fathers, most of us. Most of us here, at least, have probably had experience with the good father. Um, so somebody needs to tell you first that you had a good experience with your father. That's the same thing you have with God. Yeah. And uh, then you say, oh, really? And then it takes a little while to, for that to sink in, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you use that metaphor among some people who've had bad fathers? Remember that Bible translation, the, the paraphrase? God is the real man? Yeah. Uh, God is like my probation officer because the person that was right, he related to one of his uh, charges that the uh, probation officer was a nice guy, but the father was a, was a rotten. A scoundrel. Rotten. Yeah. yeah. He said, that young man said, if God was like my father, I, I sure would, would hate him. Yeah. So, so metaphors the, have limitations. Maybe the fact that we have good people, good fathers, mm -hmm. there's there's things to point well, to that exactly. that that may be one of the guides right there that tells us about God. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a father implies a parent-child relationship, doesn't it? An unbroken family. Well, but still, if there is a parent. Jesus says, "I'll teach you how to pray." Okay, our Father who art in heaven. Well, if you have a parent-child relationship, what is the duty on the part of the parent yeah. to the kids? To point you in the right direction. To teach them. Mm -hmm. right? And if you really, if we go through the Old Testament, God's always compl uh, complaining of how they, they don't listen. They don't take instruction. Okay? And, and there's nothing that says, well, one of these days I'm going to uh, pay the penalty for you. It's not there. He says, just listen. Turn around. Start paying attention. Mm -hmm. Well, since the days of Adam and Eve, as far as we know, no human being has had the privilege of walking and talking and communicating with any member of the Godhead, except, of course, the time when Jesus was here as a person. <coughs> so we still have that problem. And notice we mentioned earlier John 17. Look at John 17, 3. We, we sort of referred to that. And eternal life means knowing you. This is Jesus speaking about the Father. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ whom you sent. So he, Jesus was very clear. It means knowing the Father and knowing the Son. And you don't do that on, with a three by five card. No. You, you don't put the, 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 the basic principles down there. If that's all it is, you're, you have a very limited understanding and you have, basically, you've made an idol because it's not expanding. We have the infinite creator God we're supposed to learn from. Mm -hmm. and it, it, Was Jesus per perhaps thinking about Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 when he made that statement? L look at these verses. See what you think of this. The Lord says, and now for, we talked earlier about the word Yahweh. You see here it is at the top of my page here, L-O-R-D in capital letters. The Lord says, and that, that would be the Yahweh, the wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me. Because my love is constant and I do what is just and right, these are the things that I that please me, I, the Lord, have spoken. So, um, who, who gave us those words? Careful. Jesus. Jesus gave us those words, didn't he? Yeah, we believe he's the God of the Old Testament. Does it, does it seem right that we should be boasting about knowing God? Hmm. Well, if we're going to spread the word, there's a big section of that in it. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a trick here. Well, not maybe a trick, but there's an important point to recognize here. <coughs> We're not supposed to boast because we know the Lord. We're supposed to, because, to boast because we know the Lord, if you get my point. He's the one that we need to be boasting about, not us. We have the privilege of knowing him, but it's a privilege. There's no question about it. So now... I'm going to ask us to jump a little ways away from the lesson that's provided by the General Conference and ask some additional questions. In the great controversy that's spelled out in Scripture, 
and the writings of Ellen White, and of course that was her specialty, talking about the Great Controversy, we come to understand that Satan and his colleagues have launched an all-out campaign to misrepresent, to lie about, to, you know, cheat all three members of the Godhead. Notice these comments taken from various places in the writings of Ellen White regarding what Satan has said about the Father and about the Son. Now, I didn't have room in my handout to put all these things in, but can you remember some of the things that Satan says about them? Arbitrary. Arbitrary. Unforgiving. Unforgiving. Vengeful. Vengeful. Harsh. Harsh. Severe. Severe. Tyrants. Harsh judges. Despotic. Despotic. Tyrannical. Tyrannical. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can go on and on and on. These are all words that Ellen White uses, quoting her, what she's seen in vision of Satan, his comments about God. And who's Satan really talking about when he uses all those words? Jesus. Yeah. The one we call Jesus. Well, but he's really he's, talking about but, himself. Yeah, well, yes. He's describing himself, himself in, but he's yeah. trying to make, it, make us think it's Jesus. And what, and what does God do when, when, the, when he's been accused? Tells the truth. What has he been doing? He, he gives us some, some stories. He tells the truth. And it takes a long time to understand those stories. The onlooking universe has took them a long time. Yeah. So, For those, Lucifer, so Lucifer is projecting his own characteristics yep. to on, God, onto God. Yep. Now, for those of you who like to look up some of those references, look at early writings, pages 218 through 220, and Great Controversy, page 535. And we're going to read you one other very interesting passage in a few moments, but those two as a starter. And if you want to look at the materials that we have, we prepare for these studies together, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. <clears throat> well, if knowing God on all that that implies, by the way, what does the word know mean in the Bible? To become intimate with. Mm -hmm. A relationship. Remember that it says Adam knew Eve, his wife, and he said, how do you do? No, no, she had a baby, right? I thought they were just introduced. They just introduced? Just joking. Okay. Well, Satan is doing his best to keep us from learning and understanding the truth about God. Because we've already said, John 17, 3, getting to really know God does what? Produces everlasting life. If there's a bunch of humans on this earth that are prepared for everlasting life, what happens to Satan? His life ends. His life ends. It's, it's all over for him. So he's doing everything he possibly can think of to keep every one of us from getting to know God. I mean, it's life and death matter for him. Is it a life and death matter for us? Yes. 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 Yeah. So how do we, uh, how do we understand or explain the apparent contradiction in the following two passages spoken so close to each other by Jesus himself on the last night before his crucifixion. Look at John 14, 8 and 9. I'm quoting from my Good News Bible. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. That is all we need. Now that sounds like a legitimate question. It doesn't a question. But here it is. You know, it's the last night of Jesus. Of course, Philip doesn't know that. But this is the last night of Jesus' life on this earth. And Philip was saying, oh, by the way, we'd like to know about the Father, huh? <laughs> Doing it for three, three and a half years. Jesus answered, for a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Okay, that's what he said to Philip in John 14. A few chapters later, still the same evening, John 17, now in his prayer he says, Jesus in his prayer to his father says, I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. I gave them the message that you gave me, and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. Does that sound like a little bit contradictory? In what way? Well, Philip talks like he does. he's never heard of the father, doesn't know anything about father, and Jesus says, I've, I've, made it all, I've made it all known to you all along. So just because well, he asked that question contradicts what well, chronologically, he's saying there. Mm -hmm. Chronologically, by that time, he's told him who the father, that he was represented. Yeah, within the, father, the next, so. couple, next hour or so, you mean? Yeah, probably. Maybe. 
Ken? Hopefully. Yeah. In John 14, 8, where Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, that is all we need. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard some speculate that this is actually paraphrasing, Jesus, we know what you're like. Is the Father really like you? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that consistent with what the text says? Yeah, exactly. Well, you put... But what's, and, and let's be clear. What is the problem with that? What, 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 is, what is Philip's mind struggling with here? We, we need to be honest here. Predisposition of concepts well, that we have. Okay, where did they get their <coughs> concepts of God? The teachings that they've been exposed to prior to Jesus. Which Jesus. theoretically were derived from? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. So what Philip is really asking, hold on just a second. We know you, you're loving, kind, so considerate, etc., etc., etc. But what about that God that we learned about from the Old Testament mm -hmm. the and God. the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that scares us to death? Jesus, you certainly wouldn't send she bears. You wouldn't drown everyone but eight in a flood. And you wouldn't shout at people from the top of Mount Sinai. None of that stuff, right? No. Wouldn't have the earth open up and swallow. Or Dathan and Abiram? Mm hmm Now, what about that? Well, Jesus' mm -hmm. response here implies something like this. Let's put it in real modern gut kind of language. Is it possible that after walking with me, this is Jesus talking, we're putting words in his mouth, is it possible that after walking with me, hearing my words, seeing my miracles, of feeding the crowds, healing the sick, raising the dead, you do not know me? Is it possible that you do not recognize the Father and the works that He does through me? Pretty incredible, huh? Well, of course, what, what Jesus is asking there is, do you not realize that I'm the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Do you not realize that I am God? After but all, the Messiah this? is supposed to, I'm <coughs> speaking like a Jew now, the, supi, supi, the Messiah <laughs> is supposed to you know, save us from the Romans, right? That was their paradigm. Mm -hmm. So That was their belief. Everything had to fit with that. So what makes us think that our paradigm today, we aren't confused? Well, if you f keep following yeah, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, get yeah, to yeah, John 15, yeah, 15, yeah, yeah. and then John 16, 25, and yeah. so forth, uh, he kind of brings them along with that. Yeah. But, but you know, this what we're reading here, this was John did this toward the end of the first century after a lot of they've been exposed. Seventy years later. Yeah. So uh, what was going on prior to that? So how do we understand <coughs> these words? Do you think, I'm just asking sort of opinion here, do you think this is the first time that Jesus has actually spoken about the Father to the disciples? Probably not. No. Not at all. Not at all. <coughs> Hadn't Jesus tried to explain to them many times? Well, what was Jesus trying to tell the disciples about his father? One thing he did, though, that we get to John 16, 25 and 26. He says, I'm going to talk to you plainly now. Mm -hmm. Earlier on in Matthew, he says he did no teaching except by the means of parables. Mm -hmm. So some of this stuff must have just gone past them. They were just listening, engrossed in the, in the uh, they didn't realize. The details it was, of the yeah, story. Yeah. Yeah. Some, well, some of those parables still go past us. Yeah. Well, uh, what if... Um, if you thought that Jesus during a time was a prophet, I mean, what would, what would tell them that he was anything more than a prophet? And if he was a prophet, well, wouldn't you ask him that question? Wouldn't that fit right into it? Well, that, that's what they thought the Messiah was going to be, was another prophet like Elijah or... Moses. Yeah, or Moses or something like that. They didn't expect... For Pete's sake, God to come down here himself and run around doing all of what he's doing. But weren't they looking for the, the person that was going to free them from the Romans? Yes. And so if they were looking for a person that was freeing them from the Romans and he wasn't going to be God, he was going to be a prophet, then why were they asking about God, show us the Father? Well... Because they've struggled with this, and now Jesus is trying to put them, really nail it down, and they're starting to say, hold on, you know. So the wheels what, what, were turning in the right direction. 
Yeah, I think probably, starting yeah. to. They think he's just a prophet. They think all that he has done mm -hmm. is different than what I guess God would do. I, I guess that's what it would, yeah. would be a logical conclusion. There. Well, uh, like any other prophet. We Unfortunately, do. we don't have the recordings and the video of Jesus' 30 years here on earth to look back and say, that's where he tried to tell them because the only people that we have the reports from are the disciples who didn't get it for mm -hmm. so long. Yeah. So it would be nice to have Some, that. Well, we're going to see that someday. Soon. Mm -hmm. Now, my perception is that when God comes, he's going to come in the clouds of heaven. Yes. Yeah. So what makes me think based upon the experiences of these, we've discussed here, the disciples and the Jewish leaders and everybody else, they thought he was coming in a certain way and they were wrong. How do I know that I haven't come to this, fallen into Very the same trap? Question. Let me ask you this question. Since <clears throat> we're talking about the Father, that's the main focus of this lesson. How would things be different if the Father had come instead of the Son? We're told that wouldn't wouldn't have been any difference. Well, what kind of difference are you talking about? I'm asking you. I'm, 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 what, do you what do you think the Father would have done differently? <clears throat> what do you think the Father would have done differently? Mm -hmm. I wonder, as far as teaching goes, it would be the same. Mm -hmm. But when you ask that question, is that really something that could possibly happen? Well, let me, let, let's, let's picture this now as many Christians picture it. I mean, this is not my version of what would have happened, but many Christians picture, remember, God is up there. He's the sovereign of the universe. He's all-powerful, and he needs a lot of people pleading with him just to get him to forgive us. Because he's angry. Mm -hmm. Because we're sinners. Well, then so, we wouldn't want that angry God to come. Right. So his message would be the same as Jesus, is that he is loving. The, the con it's well, he's angry. He's it's upset. He's, it's, it's possible he's very the unforgiving. The concepts that he would be teaching would be identical to the concepts that Jesus would be teaching, but it's arguable that because he's a different personality, he may have used a different approach. Well, first of all, different it can't parables. Happen. It can't happen. God can't come down like Jesus did, <coughs> because what did Solomon say with his temple, that God can't even, I mean, the, the highest heavens there is can't hold him. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not the question, isn't, was can right? God, what? Was Solomon right? Absolutely. I think he was absolutely right. He was talking I, about I, Jesus. Remember, remember G, the God of the that's Old That's right. Old Testament remember, is Jesus. Jesus is God. That's right. So when you start talking about the Father versus the Son, you're talking, you are talking about two different things, two different versions of the same God, aren't okay. you? Well, fortunately for me, I have the words of Ellen White. And she said this. This is the, <laughs> written in 1895, that I may know him, page 338, um, or <clears throat> volume 21 of manuscript releases, page 393, for the full, the full letter. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him. Now remember, Jesus had to veil his glory, otherwise we couldn't have looked at him. The history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. And every act of Jesus, and every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight and hearing and effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Well, what did that say? I mean, that's What that's that says, huge. if Jesus had stayed in but, heaven. But it said, if God had come down. Mm -hmm. But he did come down, because Jesus came down. Which is the point exactly. I know. There's no difference between I know. Them. That's, that's what's, that's well, what's just kind of mind-blowing about it, because it's, it's hard to really, to really do some separations and do some, com do some different um, comparisons, because okay. you can't. Okay, well, but you see, here's the problem. And we're, 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 how many times have you heard people suggesting that somehow or other the Father needs to be appeased, it needs to be, you know, calm down, calm down now, please forgive, Father. Here's my blood, my blood, Father, please forgive. 
That doesn't sound like Jesus and the Father are exactly the same. So he, she is saying that he, they are the same mm -hmm. by ta telling them they're different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's just mind-blowing. Well, we know that the disciples had a hard time getting it. Uh, the, my famous verse for that is, is, is Luke 18, starting with verse 31. Jesus, this, now this is Jesus on his way from Jericho up the steep road to Jerusalem, ju on their way to pa the final Passover. He's going to be dead one week from this statement. Okay? Mm -hmm. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we're going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, are any of those words in long Latin words that we can't understand? <laughs> are they multisyllable, you know, 16-cylinder words? No, they're all very simple, straightforward even a child can understand most of them. But the disciples, it goes on to say, did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Hidden does not mean someone else hid it from them. It means, it means that they did not understand it the understanding. Their paradigm. It, their, it was different than their paradigm, and they <clears throat> couldn't, they ju it couldn't compute. It, it went in this ear and it got so twisted up and backwards compared to what they were normally thinking that it, they just couldn't figure out what in the world he was talking about. Because they knew, and they were, quite, they were very excited about what was happening, because they realized that the swell of popular opinion in favor of Jesus was so enormous, they were certain that they were marching up the seal, and when they got to, the, to Jerusalem, he was going to be crowned king. They were certain of it. And they were going to be ministers, cabinet exactly. ministers. Okay. On the right and on the left. Yep. <laughs> so, now, let's, let's, let's try to understand why Jesus needed to make these some very stark statements about the Father in his day. Here's a quotation that just blows me away, and everyone needs to read this about ten times, I think, to just start to comprehend it. What were the prevailing ideas about God in Jesus' day? In that light, what did Jesus come to do? Okay, you want to know why Jesus had to come? The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. And God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. Remember the words we used a little while ago? God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. Do we ever suggest that God is like that? The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So, what did we say? We said Satan is trying to project himself onto God. And those are rumors that we actually mm -hmm. hear. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. Why did he come? To teach. To teach men of the Father. To correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, he was God, could not fail to accomplish the work. And then some incredible words. The only way in which he could set and keep men right. Do we have other words for set and keep men right? The word justify for set men sanctify. right is justify. The word for keep men right is sanctify. But I don't know why we need those great long words from Latin that we don't understand. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. To do what? Make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. So Christ, if that's the situation, then why did he wait 4,000 years to do that? Why didn't he just come long ago? And because he here? needed to wait until all of Satan law, Satan's lies were out there. 
evil. And here, here's, here are people who believed, literally believed and taught that they were the correct representatives of God and they were just absolutely wrong, misrepresenting God, lying about God every day. And God says, okay, now in th the truth stands out in stark contrast to the heirs. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, those, in the fullness of time, mm -hmm. that's when he could do that. He couldn't do that until all of this stuff and the stuff prior had happened. It, it, it was, it, that's the teaching that God, God has to do with his finite creatures. Well, we read on, Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. Now, wouldn't we like to know what the whole purpose of Christ's mission on earth is? To set men right through the revelation of God. Jesus himself, if we believe these words from Ellen White, Jesus' whole purpose for coming to this earth was to correctly represent Godhead. And all that has to go on in our brain. Yeah. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal <coughs> grace and the matchless. We talk about the paternal grace. That's the Heavenly Father we're talking about in this lesson, right? The paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, this is Jesus, I have manifested thy name. This is before he's dead, okay, before he's been, before he's been beaten, before he's been crowned with a crown of thorns, before any of that has happened. I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, and now she says, in case you didn't get it when I said it a moment ago, I'm going to say it again. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world. What did he come for? Reveal. To reveal God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to man. So if that's the purpose, then it was accomplished at that time. What are we waiting around for now? <laughs> because we have exactly the same problem that the disciples had. Well, yeah, but I'm going to get that figured out in a couple of years, and then I will die, but then my offspring will come along, and they won't have it all so figured out. So how do we, how do we <laughs> rectify that situation? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's what we're here for, okay? <laughs> the thing that amazes me along with this is that there are still cause to certain theology that oh, yeah. God still has to be appeased. Oh know? yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, has that's, the tip, that's the typical teaching. <clears throat> it sounds like what we're proposing here is that there has to be an understanding that comes to fruition on the part of everyone all at once. And that sounds like an odd thing to happen. <laughs> you know, 2,000 years ago, the situation was very religious, okay? They had something to, they could see, the temple and all that sort of, it was very, very religious. Now we're, li and, and yet, and he came at that time, Jesus came at that time to reveal the Father, and they didn't recognize him. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a situation where basically the whole world has become pagan, one way or another, totally irreligious, and yet there's going to be a few people like Job that will have be able to speak and share and uh, will hang tough like uh, the 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. So that's one way of looking at it. <clears throat> I would like to ask you out there, our listeners, how many of you have heard that statement about Jesus' entire mission to this earth? How many of you have heard that statement quoted from Ellen White in the past? From the pulpit. From anywhere. 99.9% .9 have not. And yet Ellen White says that's the whole purpose of his mission. We haven't, Jay, you want to know why we're still here? We haven't done it a bit like we should have. You know, though, um, if, if somebody did repeat that at the pulpit, you still have to understand it. Yeah. You still have to know what the message was. You're going to yeah. still have to open the Bible up yeah. and then... Go through experiences yourself to yes. find out, you know, what the Bible's talking about. So all that stuff still needs to happen. Yeah. But, but are you saying that 
that verse there needs to be to told over the pulpit? What? That, that would change everything? What I'm saying that if people said, okay, we're going to read every story in the Bible with that in mind. This story is supposed to teach us something about God. It's not a story about just about Noah or Adam or take anything you want from the Bible. This story is not primarily about human beings. It's primarily about God. And if we could have that attitude, we could ask ourselves, okay, what am I learning from God at this Sabbath school? What am I learning about God from my experiences at home this week? What am I learning about God from everything that transpires in the world around me? It would transform us. So did Jesus come more to live than he, than he came to die? He came to teach. Well, I would like to suggest, I don't have time now to spell it all out, but I would like to suggest this. He came to give us a choice. There, there are two options. We can choose to follow his example, the best of our ability, giving, and there's ways that that can happen with the help of the Holy Spirit and live the kind of life that he lived, or we will die the death which he died. There's the choices. And he, he showed us the whole thing just as, and, and, and by showing us that so very clearly, he basically was telling the truth about God. Because remember, back at the beginning, Satan said, oh no, if you sin, you're not going to die. And Jesus says, just watch me. Just watch me. Well, we need to try to finish up the lesson here. Well, we know that this is not what's usually taught about the mission of Jesus, or about, you know, we've, we, we're, we're taught that Jesus came and died is to give a sacrifice, to appease the Father, etc. Uh, look at this example. D did Jesus come to pay the price for sin? What does it say about, to us about God when we read, in some translations, words like these? Now, I, I bless Kenneth Taylor. I think he, he helped a lot of people by making the Bible very readable. But look at this, Romans 3.25, the Living Bible. For God sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment for our sins and to end all God's anger against us. What a miserable translation. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't have to say it quite that obvious. Well, I want to be obvious. I mean, that, that is, it, well, we don't need to dance around it. How, how does that fit with John 3.16, which says God so loved the world? Is he angry? Can he be angry and love us at the same time? And the King James Version isn't much better. It sort of hides its truth behind long Latin words, calls the death, of the, the coming of Jesus a propitiation. What's a propitiation? They got that from the Brems Version of 1582, was called it a propitiatory. Yeah. The same word that uh, Tyndale had called a, what a mercy, excuse me, a mercy seat, and uh, brought it over from, from uh, Luther. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, but it, what what went on at the at the the day of the lid, the day of, uh, we call the day of atonement, which is a distortion. Yeah. <laughs> well, atonement, well is think, atonement is taken on the idea of an appeasement, yeah. rather than a, a, a time of reconciliation, of making at one, mm -hmm. in harmony, is what it was meant to be, not to pay a penalty to somebody. What a t pagan yeah. concept. Yeah, here's, the, here's, the, here's what we're talking about here. Let's be honest. The, the, what was supposed to happen from the beginning, we were supposed to be deathly afraid of sin, and we were supposed to love God. And what has happened over millennia? Afraid of God. We love our sins, and we're scared to death of God. I mean, the devil has been incredibly successful at turning everything upside down. So how did that happen? Do you, think, do you really believe that Jesus did everything he could to try to communicate the truth about his Father? I do. Could we, by studying the Bible and writings of Ellen White, could we get that picture clearly and could we, could we voice it in words that would help others around us? I'm not so sure if you can guarantee you can come up with words that would voice that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person's got to hear the words first and then try to understand them. And it takes and it's time. Gonna, yeah. gonna happen. You know, there's, there's one other bit about um, Jesus paying the price. You can look at it as a, a teacher. 
I mean, you probably had some students that you, <laughs> you had to go teach. And, you, you know, you have to, it, it really takes a lot of work to teach these, and yeah. the teachers have to go through it. So in some ways, that's the price that he had to pay. Yeah. Well stated. So, I like that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what, 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 if you had to pick something out of the Bible, uh, this would be the New Testament, have to be the New Testament. If you have to pick one section of the New Testament where Jesus speaks most clearly about the Father, what would you pick? John 16, 25 to 27. What about some of the very last words he spoke to his disciples? They're found in John 16, 25 to 27. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, you would think that thought, these ought to be maybe some of the most precious words in the Bible, right? Here you have God himself living as a human being here, and he wants to speak to us plainly about the God of heaven, right? When that day comes, whenever it comes, still coming for a lot of us, I have a fear, you will ask him in my name, and I do, it says not, I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. You mean he's not pleading for us up there? For the Father himself loves you. He doesn't need anybody to plead with him. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I come from God. I did, I did come from the Father and I came into the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. I mean, yes. In verse 29 too, and then what the disciples' response. Then the disciples said to him, Now you are speaking plainly without using figures of speech. Did they recognize that Jesus was trying? But why was this a problem for them? Paradigms are like a prison. <laughs> well, this is, this is, <clears throat> it seems to be turning the whole priestly system from, of the Old Testament upside down, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. It seems, it, they should have asked right there, well, what about the high priests in the Old Testament? What was going on there in the sanctuary in the Old Testament? <clears throat> but they didn't. They didn't. So I guess it's our turn to ask, right? Should they have asked, why are you the Lamb of God? Mm -hmm. Why are you coming to the slaughter? What was the first thing that John the Baptist said to some of these disciples about Jesus? <coughs> Down at the Jordan. This is the Lamb Behold the Lamb of God, God, which taketh away the sin, sin of the world. world. Yeah which was very, very much the paradigm of the old sacrificial sister. So are we saying he confused them? Well, they weren't all there at that time, were they? There were just two no, or three of them. Three but you yeah. would have thought that something would have caught the, somebody's mind to pass it on. Yeah. Well, we know that God's very essence and the essence <coughs> of his government is love. First John 4, 8, 16. I mean, those are very familiar passages. The very essence of Satan's government is selfishness. We are all born selfish. That is, as infants and children, we think of nothing else except ourselves, our needs and wants. And, and we understand that that's kind of what a child does. Christianity is God's way of encouraging us to grow up and leave our selfishness, our satanity behind and adopt God's plan of love. Think about it. What percentage of your daily activities are basically motivated by selfishness? I had a patient in the office today, and I understand where she's coming from. She's had some real disasters in her family recently, and she just came in, she says, it's time for me to stop thinking about all these other people. It's time for me to do something for myself. I gotta do something for myself. And she just kept saying it. The time has come for me to do something for myself. Well, how often do we do things that are truly loving? When the truth is known, some of our lives look pretty bad. So we have these words from uh, Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to, un to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant, 
In other words, he has seen everything or in which he takes no immediate interest. He healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalm 147 verse 3. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full do you, have you experienced this? As though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Sosteps Christ, page 100. Do we live as if God gave the best gift of heaven just for us? And do we respond? We should be willing to give everything we can give for him. That's the kind of a loving response that should come forth. Well, what would happen if we were really doing that? Do you have any idea? Okay. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Everyone who lives, I'm sorry, everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many of you have been persecuted this week? Mm, several times. <laughs> okay. You will have to hear about that later, I guess. <laughs> We live so comfortably. Is that because we're not representing God correctly? Now, Revelation 13 says that the persecution is coming. There's no question about it. Satan is doing everything he can to deceive us and confuse us by misrepresenting the Father. Paul made it very clear that all three members of the Godhead are on our side. Romans 8, 26 and 27, 31 to 39. They cooperated in the earthly ministry of Jesus, Luke 3, 21 and 22, John 14, 16 and 17. With all three of them on our side, do we have anything to fear? In order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name, a name entwined with the dearest associations of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. This name, spoken him and of him, is a sign of our love and trust toward him and a pledge of his regard and relationship to us. Spoken when, he ask, when asking his favor or blessing, it is as music to his ears. Then we might not think it presumption to call him by this name. He has repeated that we might not think it a presumption to call him by this name. He has repeated it again and again. He desires to become familiar with the appellation. And God is asking you to call him. Your, his father, your father.